Hello everyone, I'm Ted Oakley, Managing Partner at Oxbow, and I'm really excited today to have Louis Gov. Louis is the Managing Partner and Founder of GovCal Research. They research and manage money all over the world. Louis lives in Hong Kong and Vancouver. He grew up in Paris. He's had an interesting life. He was in the French Army and the infantry. He's really well, well versed in the world. And I'm glad to have Lewis here and tell us about what he's thinking about from a little different point of view. But Lewis, we're certainly glad to have you. Well, thanks for having me, Ted. It's, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed our visit together in Vail a couple months ago. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm glad we can catch up again today. Well, one of the things that people don't know about you, Lewis, if they don't know much about you, is you, have, you live in Hong Kong and you live in Vancouver. Uh, you grew up in Paris. You have a really good look at the world. I think as good as anybody that that I ever talked to. But you might start giving us some information. You 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 have some really good information on the different forces at work, as far as inflation, deflation, that sort of thing. You might give us sort of a rundown on how that looks to you. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, yeah, I you mentioned it. I, I did grow up in Paris. Um, so I, as a Parisian, I would say that modesty doesn't come naturally to me. Um, but today, um, today I think we have no choice as investors, but to be very modest, uh, for the reason you just highlighted, namely the fact that a lot of the structural forces, uh, at work, um, are pulling us in very different directions. Um, and, you know, my starting point when, when I look at markets is that, um, managing money isn't as much about picking winners as avoiding losers, right? You, right? you want to basically build a diversified portfolio that diversify against the things that are likely to happen. And, and you, you strip out the things that are unlikely to happen. And, you know, for, for most of my career, uh, so I've been in the markets for 25 years, we've lived in a broadly deflationary environment, right? Um, and, and so the best portfolios, you know, what most people did, you put 60% in equities, 40% in treasuries, and you went to the beach and things sort of took care of themselves uh, year in, year out. And of course, that completely failed you in 2022. Uh, and the reason it failed you, I think, is a lot of the trends that were underpinning markets for 25 years uh, have now completely shifted. The, the most obvious one, of course, is globalization, right? For, for 25 years, we lived in a world where we're constantly outsourcing um, constantly looking for the lowest cost producer outside of, of our borders. And very often that happened to be in China. Um, and the whole geopolitical situation around the world has caused everybody to put a pause on this uh, and to at least question the wisdom of, uh, of such a course of action. Um, so we've moved from a world that was globalizing to a world that, you know, I think we can say it, it's, it's almost feels like a new cold war, right? Um, That's the concept of uh, onshoring you're talking about, basically, a lot of that. Onshoring, French shoring, um, and this concept of sort of the, the new Cold War, you know, I've spent most of my career, um, uh, you know, I, I went to college as the Berlin Wall fell down. So I lived in a world where we sort of had 30 years of peace dividend, uh, again, 30 years of globalization, et cetera. And, and to me, that, that, that now feels over. Um, and... So that, that, that is one very big, important cha change. Uh, another big, important change that you and I discussed when we were in Vail um, is the fact that uh, labor markets in the world's major economies are no longer growing. Um, you know, for, for 25 years, you know, I've, I've spent really a lot of time looking at China because we're based in Hong Kong, office in Beijing. Um, I was lucky enough to have a front row seat on the world's greatest economic transformation. Um, but it, when you look back to China's economic miracle, you know, sort of 25 years at 10% plus GDP growth, it was the combination of two things. It was first adding workers and second, making those workers more productive. You know, China would transform farmers that would produce goods worth a thousand bucks a year into factory workers that produce goods worth 15,000 bucks a year. Uh, and as you did this, and as you added an extra 15 million of these guys every year, you end up with double digit GDP growth. Because at the end of the day, economic growth is how many workers do you have and how productive are they? Um, and 
Um, and so today you look at the US, you look at China, you look at Japan, you look at Europe, none of the major economies are adding workers anymore. Um, and so if we're going to have growth, it means that our workers need to run faster. <laughs> you know, they need to be more productive than they've ever been. Um, and here are we giving them the tools for them to be more productive. And here I would argue, well, deglobalization is a hindrance on productivity. Now we might, you know, you and I might have a debate on whether it makes good sense geopolitically, et cetera, but there's no doubt that economically speaking, it's a hindrance on, on productivity. Um, and then I think you get to, to the other big question that's out there in the, in the big structural shifts. Um, there's different ways to look at economic growth. One of them is workers plus the productivity of these workers. Another way I look at growth is to say that growth is energy transformed. You know, most economic activity is requires a lot of energy. And uh, the reality is in the past 10 years, we've done everything we could to make energy more expensive. You know, the, the whole history of humanity for 2000 years or the whole recorded history of humanity is basically one of making energy more efficient and less costly. You know, so we start off burning wood, uh, and then we move to coal, uh, to whale oil, and then to coal, and then and then to oil, and then to natural gas, and then to nuclear. Each time, you know, comes with productivity gains, stronger economic growth. But in the past 10 years, 10, 15 years, we've said, forget all this. Let's move to a less efficient form of energy. You know, let's move to solar. Let's move to wind. It's less efficient, but it's better for the long term. So let's let's... Let's do that, which, you know, again, we can debate whether it makes sense or not. As from the tone of my voice, you can probably guess which way I'm, I lean on whether it makes <laughs> sense. Uh, but um, so, you know, in a, at a time where labor force is shrinking, where we need to make the workers more productive, we're also adding on top of it a higher cost of energy, fundamentally, uh, because that's that's what we're, we're doing through the energy transition. Um, and so you put all this together, and again, uh, you have to accept that this is a very, very different investment environment than the one we've had for the past 25 years. Um, and so you have to be very modest in front of markets that are trying to readjust to, I think, an underlying reality that's getting more and more complicated. And you mentioned, uh, actually, all the things you just mentioned were in your sort of your inflationary bust concept. And then you had an inflationary boom concept on top of that, and then a deflation on both sides, too. How do you... How do you think it actually ends? <laughs> yeah, so what you refer to is um, is the sort of diagram that uh, we start most of our research with. And the idea is a pretty simple one, that asset prices are sort of driven by the interaction of changes in inflation and changes in economic activity. And to, to your point, that gives you four potential scenarios, right? Inflationary boom or inflationary bust, deflationary boom and deflationary bust. Um, and yeah, for all the reasons we've just discussed, it's hard to know where, where you are today structurally. And I would argue it's also hard to know where you are cyclically. Um, you know, right now, I think if you're playing recession or bust bingo at home, you're probably saying, oh, look, inverted US yield curve, collapsing bank loans, collapsing banks for that matter, falling, money, falling monetary aggregates, uh, falling ISM surveys, falling leading indicators. Um, you know, most of the signs are pointing to a big U.S. slowdown. At the same time, you have the world's second largest economy, namely China, that is now being goosed up by the Chinese authorities after three years of being artificially kept underwater. For me, the Chinese economy is like a ball, you know, one of these beach balls that you keep underwater and you're releasing the hand and all of a sudden it's, it's popping up, right? And so, you know, in my career, I've never had the two major economies in the world going literally in opposite directions. Um, and so cyclically, you know, where, where does that leave you? Um, it's if and you want to focus on mean, the U S by that, you mean China going up and the U S yep. going down. Yeah. In terms of economic growth, economic absolutely. Growth, right. Right. In terms of economic growth. And so it does leave you with a quandary. Um, and, you know, if you want to make the argument that we're heading to a deflationary bust, you could point towards the U.S. bust banks, the falling U.S. leading indicators, the falling U.S. ISMs. Um, but then, and again, it all depends where you sit in the world. Um, I, you know, sitting in Hong Kong, sitting in Beijing, where our offices are, I look at what's unfolding in China and I think, well, and also, you know, we're all the fruits of our own experiences, right? And in my career, 
I saw the big rebound in global growth in 2003 be driven by Chinese stimulus. And the big rebound in 2009 from the mortgage crisis be driven by Chinese stimulus. And the rebound of 2015, 16 be driven by Chinese stimulus. And then now, once again, China stimulating. So I've got this sort of, personally, this embedded bias to think, oh, well, when China stimulates, um, it tends to leak into emerging markets, and then it leaks into Europe, and then it leaks into Japan, uh, and it gets global growth going again. Um, and so, but today, again, it's perhaps more complicated, uh, more complicated by deglobalization and all these things. But, you know, to the all important question, are we an inflationary bust, inflationary boom, deflationary bust or deflationary boom? For me, I come out, I don't know if we're in a bust or in a boom. I think in the US, the risk is on a bust. I think in China, the risk is on a boom. But how this evens out uh, in the wash and how that comes out, time <clears> will tell. What I feel pretty confident of, though, is that we are in an inflationary environment. Uh, and that's the structural shift of the past two or three years. That the days where you know you could buy 60% equity, 40% bonds and go to the beach, those days are over. Mm -hmm. um, that building portfolios is now much more complicated because equities and bonds are now positively correlated. Yeah. And you tell you, you know, also, Louis, if you look at it, if you look at how the major mistakes that the Federal Reserve and the government to that degree made since 2009 by keeping those rates at basically the zero bound for such a long period, uh, it just seemed like those eras were really egregious when you get right down to it. There's no doubt about it. And like, I, I agree 100% with, with what you just said. You know, people often ask me, but isn't the Fed making a mistake by raising interest rates or keeping rates as high as they are? And forget it, the mistake was made years ago. Right. <laughs> you know, right. the mistake, the, the, the mistake's already been done. It's, uh, and we're, we're now paying the price for, for, for this mistake. Um, the reality is that, you know, there's two things that matter, right? There's the cost of capital and there's the availability of capital. Um, now, in the US for 15 years, you had a much too low cost of capital given the overall structural growth in the US, et cetera. Having interest rates at zero or close to zero made no sense. Um, at the same time in the US, not only did you have a very low cost of capital, you also had very strong availability of capital. Because if you look at say Japan and Europe, Japan and Europe also had very low cost of capital, but the capital wasn't that easy. You know, because of the European banking crisis, because of the Japanese banking crisis, you'd walk into a bank in Tokyo or in Paris and you'd say, I'd want a loan and they'd tell you to go pound sand. Um, this is this was never the case in the US. And I think we're people are waking up to this as the cost of capital goes up in the US. This is when you realize, you know, it's the old uh, John Stuart Mill um, uh, saying that um, capital panics do not destroy capital. Panics just reveal the extent to which it, it has already been destroyed. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is what we are right now. You know, things like FTX, like Silicon Valley Bank, um, they're not destroying capital. The capital is already destroyed. It's just the, the revelation that the cost of capital was too low for too long and capital was too plentiful. And so stupid things was, do was done with it. Um, and here, I think we're seeing a very important change in the zeitgeist because Remember, just when we met a couple months ago, the general perception of everyone out there, of most people you talk to in the general media, uh, in the financial press, was that the US was the cleanest dirty shirt, right? That you needed to be invested in the US because you know, that's where return on capital was decent and lots of reason, but the US was by far the cleanest dirty shirt. And to me, it feels that in the past four or five weeks, the zeitgeist has completely changed. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's talking about de-dollarization. Everybody's talking about how foreigners don't want to own at, uh, assets in the US anymore. Um, this is a very, very important shift in, in, in the zeitgeist. And I think it, ref it's, it was triggered partly by Silicon Valley Bank, partly by FTX, partly by people realizing, hold on, in this past cycles, the excesses took place in the US. All the stupid stuff, the GameStop, the Bed Bath and Beyond, yeah. all, the, all the crazy Facts. stuff, it, <laughs> it took place in the US. And until this is all cleaned up, and you know, I don't think we're done cleaning, cleaning the mess up, mm -hmm. um, until this mess is cleaned up, uh, the US dollar will be heading lower. You know, and also, Louis, you know, uh, it's funny, interesting to make it the longer term of it, because I've always said when you come off a bubble, 
as big as this bubble, and it was bigger than the internet bubble, it takes a long time to wring it out because there's all this hidden debt everywhere. It's starting to show up right now, but I'm 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 not trying to put words in your mouth. But I, if I understand the information that we're showing here, you probably it seems like you have more of an inclination toward an inflationary boom or inflationary bust than anything else, more than the deflationary side. Absolutely, uh, yeah. absolutely, and and I would say especially in the U.S. To be honest, because. Um, you know, when I was when I was growing up, I was made to read uh, what I, you know, the first economists you read have a, probably an undue influence on you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was meant to, I was made to read a, a French economist of the 1960s and 70s called Jacques Rueff, who was uh, a great, uh, and he was, you know, De Gaulle's advisor. He was the one who told De Gaulle, "Get your get your gold out of uh, get your gold out of the U.S. while you still can." Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, back in uh, the good late advice. '60s, when the U.S. <laughs> yeah, it was good advice, right? Because the U.S. was following bread and butter, yeah. you know, uh, guns and butter policies. Um, and you know, Rueff's main appreciation uh, was actually how foreign exchange markets work, and his main saying was that. Uh, the exchange rate is basically the receptacle in which unri unearned rights accumulate. Um, in essence, the, the exchange rates tend to always be the first variable of adjustment um, when things go bad, partly because it's, you know, it's the path of least resistance for policymakers, right? Mm -hmm. Devaluing the currency is easier than having bankruptcies. It's easier than having restructurings. It's easier than tightening your belt. Um, and, you know, if like me, you've done emerging markets for 25 years, this is a pattern you're very familiar with. Um, you know, wrong policies impact the exchange rates. And I would argue that in the US uh, over the past few years, you've had crazy monetary policies and crazy fiscal policies. Um, and the crazy fiscal policies, by the way, continue. You know, when you see things like the Inflation Reduction Act, it's it's almost like they're, they're, they're like guarding you. You know, they're like, taunting you it's like they're it's like oh we're going to spend an extra one and a half trillion dollar and call it the inflation reduction act it's uh you know since when does does adding a trillion and a half to government debt reduce inflation um they really take people for idiots um and the the reality is that kind of thing gets reflected in the currency and i think you're starting to see that so to answer your question it's a long-winded answer but if like me you believe the u.s dollar is now heading lower that's inflationary, fundamentally, especially for an economy like the United States, um, where so much of the manufactured goods are now imported, uh, either imported from Mexico, imported from China, from Japan, from Korea, um, where manufacturing has become such a small part of US GDP that import prices actually do matter. So, Louis, I want a question for you on this. Do you think a lot of this got pushed forward faster or kicked off because uh, when the administration, you know, froze the assets through the SWIFT system of Russia and then all the other countries. Uh, and this, you have a lot of input on this. And so I wanted to see what you thought. Is it really possible to have another currency where they put that, you know, cross border and they put that together? Um, and that's sort of a two pronged question, but I, I know you have some good thoughts on it. Yeah, look, uh, th thanks for bringing that up. It's, uh, you know, as soon as they did this, and for me, it wasn't as much, to be honest, so this goes back a year ago, right, when when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, the, the reaction of Western policymakers was to not only confiscate the assets of the Russian Central Bank, which is one thing, but to also go out and confiscate the assets of all the Russian oligarchs, their houses, their football clubs, their yachts, their private jets, you, you name it. Um, and... And I found that exceptionally shocking. Uh, I found that exceptionally shocking because I used to think that the greatest comparative advantage of the Western world in general, but especially especially the United States, was the fact that we have the rule of law. And I say we as the Western world in general. We have the rule of law and the sanctity of property rights. Um, now, the rule of law for me means that I can only be judged for what I've done. I can't be judged for my father's crime. I can't be judged for my son's crime. I can't be judged because I'm French or because I'm Roman Catholic, at least not by a court of law, right? I can't, you know, go to jail because of something a Catholic priest did, even though I'm Catholic. Um, 
But that is precisely what we did with the Russians, right? We mm -hmm. said, uh, because you're Russian, we're going to take your stuff. And we're going to do so without a court of law and without uh, any debate in parliament. We're going to get you know, Joe Biden, Boris Johnson, Emmanuel and Macron together in a room, and they're going to decide to do this. This matters tremendously because, for me, the greatest comparative advantage of the Western world was its ability to produce assets and to sell basic, fundamentally overvalued assets to people from China, from the Middle East, from Indonesia, Malaysia, you, you name it. And you know, if you're Chinese, the reason you buy a house in Vancouver isn't because you love hiking or skiing. You know, the reason you buy a house in Vancouver is you perceive that house to be safe. And you think, you know, if ever something bad happens, I, I have that house is a fail safe for me. Um, and now we've said, well, you know, if Xi Jinping happens to be a jerk and invade Taiwan, then we can take that house for you. Now, if you're Chinese, you think, I bought that house because I already think Xi Jinping is a jerk. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is this is my failsafe. Yeah, and now you tell me that if, uh, that's the reason I bought this. And you tell me that if I think he's a jerk, if you think he's a jerk, if you decide in your great wisdom that he's a jerk, which I already know he is, yeah. um, then you're going to take it away from me. Well, then this house isn't what I think it is. Um, and so I think, you know, we obviously wanted to punish Russia. We obviously wanted to punish, when I say we, I mean in the Western world again, and wanted to punish um um, the uh, the oligarchs, etc. But in so doing, I think we've cut our nose to spite our face. Um, we have single-handedly undermined our greatest comparative advantage uh, because we've signaled to the rest of the world, if you're Chinese, you look at the Western world now and you think, oh, well, the rule of law there is the same. It's the same here as it is there. If the rulers decide they want to take your stuff, they just can. Um, and so there's no difference. So then why am I bothering? Um, and so now I think, and this, the reason this matters is the Western world runs massive current account deficits with the emerging markets. Every year we buy more from them than they buy from us. This was equating, I mean, this would, you'd find the equivalent by selling assets. Mm -hmm. So we'd buy all their tennis shoes and tennis rackets and treadmills and whatever else. And they would buy overvalued US treasuries and overvalued real estate. And now they're saying, thank you very much. We don't want that anymore. And we're right. going to keep the excess savings within the emerging market. So now what are you seeing? Massive outperformance of Brazilian bonds, massive outperformance of Chinese bonds, massive outperformance of Indonesian bonds, of Indian mm -hmm. bonds. Emerging market savings are going to stay in emerging markets. I think that's immensely bullish emerging markets. It's immensely bearish Western currencies. So, you know, you have... Um three basically underlying trends that you, 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 you singled out. And, you know, the, the first one was that the U.S. bear market is not over. Now, we think the same thing, but I'm just curious as to how you view that. Look, I think you've had a lot of excesses. You know, again, the U.S. was the epicenter of cheap money with um, with uh, available money. Um, and you're starting to see, you know, it's the old Warren Buffett saying, right? It's when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. And you've, you've started to see some nudists appear on the beach, no doubt. And all of the nudists have been in the US. Um, it's been FTX, it's been, um, um, it's been Silicon Valley Bank, it's been Signature Bank. Um, it, you could say, well, this is it. You know, we've had all the nudists, nobody else is swimming naked anymore. I doubt it. I doubt it. I think there's still there's still some some nudists to 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 be found out there. Um, but the uh, so yeah, and deep down, and I think we just saw this with Silicon Valley Bank. You know, this means that the Fed's ability to keep tightening, keep draining liquidity, is actually very very limited. Um, and you know, most people think that central banks have two mandates employment and inflation. The reality is they have three mandates. The third mandate is financial stability. Uh, and you just saw it. Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley Bank goes bust and the Fed in two weeks re-adds $400 billion, which they, it had taken them nine months to yeah. take out. So now all of a sudden, money market funds, this, an additional $400 billion in US money market funds. Mm -hmm. They're standing at record highs. The question right. we should all ask ourselves is, where's that money going to go? You know? And you could probably you could probably supplant that stability with politics, because uh, it kind of comes down to that for sure. You also mentioned that 
you one of your one of your trends you think is that the that that, that eventually the weaker dollar is going to change that whole system and that it's going to make an outperformance in commodities and emerging markets uh, you might you might talk a little about what you think there yeah no absolutely look um we, we talked a little bit about the dollar but I, I do feel like we're we're seeing a change in the zeitgeist, uh, and, and that that's unfolding in front of us. More and more people are actually realizing that uh, the weaponization of the U.S. dollar we've seen over the recent uh, over the past twelve months was actually a mistake, but it's a mistake that is very hard to to walk back. Mm-hmm. And um, and so as as you know, emerging markets basically walk away from the dollar slowly. It's not it's not a bank run. It's a it's not even a jog. It's a crawl you know it's it's a walk but markets are made at the margin um and so i think that yeah the us dollar is heading it, i think it's heading structurally lower and it was i think the strength of the us dollar was sort of the, the last thing uh holding on hold, holding on to the belief that the us is the cleanest dirty shirt out there um which which again has been the mantra for 10 years and i think that that mantra is going to be tested and shaken um now historically you know, when when the U.S. dollar is weak, you tend to do quite well in commodities, and I think there's a lot of factors that argue for commodities. On you know, uh, regardless, uh, most obvious one, of course, is China rebounding. Um, the other the other obvious one is that we spent ten years under investing in in the space, um, but the U.S. dollar it adds fuel to to the commodity fire. Um, a weak U.S. dollar is also typically good news for emerging markets because if if people or if companies have debt in emerging markets, it's always in U.S. dollars. It's interesting too. You're talking about uh, for C. You know, uh, we've been talking about Warren Buffett being Japan. You know, buying companies the last few days, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the points you made on China reopening and coming along hard here was that they would bring along Japan, Korea, and Europe along with them. That. And you didn't. That was ex-U.S. <laughs> that was a different. Look. That's a very important point. And, you know, historically, if you go back to 2003, 2008, 2015, a lot of U.S. companies benefited from Chinese growth. Um, this time around, I'm less sure because, you know, in 2018, the U.S. government said nobody's allowed to sell semiconductors to Huawei anymore. If there's any U.S. technology and you're a semiconductor, you can't sell them to Huawei. Mm-hmm. And Huawei basically imploded. Um, and at that point... Every Chinese CEO looked at their business and thought, I don't want to be the next Huawei. You know, it, take cars. It takes 3,000, you, you have roughly $3,000 of chemical products in a car. Um, and DuPont, Dow Chemical have huge comparative advantage because they have such a cheap cost of natural gas. And, you know, it's like US chemical companies have a great comparative advantage. But if you're China, if you're a Chinese car producer, you're worried that tomorrow the U.S. government decides no more chemical products to China, and then your whole supply chain is screwed up. So mm-hmm. it might make sense to just pay a little extra money to LG Chem in South Korea, or to Mitsubishi in uh, in uh, Japan, or to BASF in Germany, just because all of a sudden it's no longer just about price; it's also about the safety of your supply chain. Now, I know people. You know, that deglobalize, I guess what I'm saying is deglobalization, that knife cuts both ways. Most people in America think, oh, we, we need to to stop supplies from China. Meanwhile, in China, you know, as things reaccelerate, the U.S. will be all the way at the back of the line in terms of getting orders. You know, uh, the other thing I was going to ask you sort of in a, in a, in a closing uh, piece here, Louis, is that one of the things I like about interviewing people is if somebody... Uh, does research, but they also manage money, then I have a lot greater respect for them because they're in the trenches every day and, and they're like, us. I mean, you you know, you can talk about a lot. Of, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I always tell young people, uh, there's nothing like making you humble when you sit across from somebody and they say you didn't do a very good job. And <laughs> and so that will get you there. Uh, but let me ask you, so and I'm kind of closing out. If you if you're talking to investors today and realizing a lot of investors probably don't have quite as much ability to go overseas, you can go anywhere because you do. 
but what what would you what would you sort of in general say hey you, you might want to consider these things or have this type of look over the next one to two years look the, the main message when i talk to people uh of any age i say look the the reality is we've had 30 easy years where portfolio construction was so simple you bought equities you bought bonds again i said you went to the beach um, you know, you don't get a lot of free lunches in uh, in money management, but for portfolio diversification is probably the only free lunch you get where you can buy different things and they sort of cancel each other out and it reduces the volatility without sometimes costing you anything, right? Um, and now having said this, you know, for me, the risk today, when I look at the world, what is the biggest risk out there? And I think for me, the biggest risk, I'm not worried about the Fed raising another 25 basis points or even 50 basis points. I don't lose sleep over that. That's whatever. Um, the real risk for me is that oil goes to 150 bucks. Uh, given you know everything, and if that happens, then you get crushed on your bonds and you get crushed on your equities. Um, so this is, you know, forget owning bonds, you know, you have the companies that you love, you know, you do, you, you do the work and you love them either because they're cheap or because they have great prospects, et cetera, but you need to hedge them. You know, you have the companies that you love and you need to say, okay, what if something comes out of the blue? Um, and in the past you owned us treasuries, but forget it. Us treasuries are no longer doing that job for you. The way I put it is the us treasuries are like an offensive lineman protecting the quarterback. Um, and over the summer, they went off on holiday and they came back and now they weigh 150 pounds because they went on a diet. Who needs a 150 pound offensive lineman? The answer is nobody. Um, and the new portfolio diversification is not US treasuries. In an inflationary world in which we're in, a world where the growth is going to come out of emerging markets, a growth where, where, where a world where China is now reaccelerating, the real risk on your portfolio, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, the risk on your portfolio is that energy prices shoot up. And so forget having bonds. You need a sizable energy position in your portfolio. Um, if I'm right, you know, and well, if oil prices do shoot up, you'll be glad you have it. If oil prices stay where they are, well, you own assets that generate great cash flows. And, you know, it's not a lot of the energy stocks today are returning terrific capital to shareholders. So, you know, that you could own them just on that basis. If you stay, if you stay, though, Lewis, if you stay in a, uh, say you stay in a, you have the next two quarters or three quarters, we really are in a negative comparison, recession. Uh, do you think oil could increase in the in the face of that? Do you? Okay. Interesting. Because the, the marginal demand in the world isn't coming from the U.S. anymore. Right. So if there is a recession, it'll be in the U.S. There is no recession coming in China. There right. is no recession coming in India. There is no recession coming in Indonesia. Right. Um, these these markets are humming along, and and that's where a lot of the marginal demand is is going to come from. But fundamentally, you know, the the story on oil for me, the the reason it would, I'm not saying it is going to go to 150, but if it did go there, it wouldn't be a demand story. It'd be a supply story. Is the fact that we've underinvested for 10 years. Right. Um, and so, again, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm saying this is the risk on your portfolio. Right. So, you know, by all means, go out and buy the companies that you love. Go out and buy the Microsoft. Uh, go out and buy LVMH. Uh, go out and buy the stocks that are doing well and, you know, growing and, uh, and trending positively. But if there's going to be a, a bolt from the blue, I think it'll be on energy. And that's why treasuries, to me, are completely useless in a portfolio. Would you uh, say they weren't useless if you, like for us, we hold treasuries, but we hold, you know, three, six, and nine months as a, you're ready to pounce on something. It's not like, you know, it's not an investment side particularly. And I'm assuming you probably have uh, a degree of liquidity now as well. I don't know that, but I'm like, I, I wouldn't know. I don't count a six months treasury, a treasury that, that is cash, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just sitting there and you happen to have it in a treasury because, mm. you know, if, for, because you don't want to break the $250,000 of DIC or, or whatever else. That's just, that's just cash management. Uh, and, and I would say that's fine. But if you're looking at, you know, how do I diversify my equity positions for, for the long term? So you could do it with cash. Absolutely. But then you want to do it in cash in a strong currency. Right. 
Let me ask you uh, one last question for you. And I, this is sort of a, a philosophical question, I suppose, in some respects. Uh, we've long since said that a lot of people in the U.S. investment industry are have only been around, you know, 10 to 12, 13 years, maybe. And, and they've never seen anything that's, a, in other words, a long drawn out bear, a change in commodities, a change in inflation. Um, do you think that's going to have an impact because of the lack of experience going forward the next five to 10 years? Um, I don't know if that is. You know, I started my career and, uh, and, like within the first year I was hit with the Asian crisis. Um, and you know, that was obviously my first crisis, uh, and I was there and when you're in the midst of a crisis, you learn fast, you know, you just swim yeah. faster. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you don't have much of a choice. I think, but two years later you had the dot com. So you went through that too. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's no, it was, <laughs> it's, uh, but the, um, so exactly. By then I was ready. Um, the, I think what's going to change the nature of things this time around, to be honest, isn't the fact that people are younger, et cetera, um, but it's the structure of the savings. In that, in this bull market, um, everybody thought, I can buy the S&P 500 and I've got a diversified portfolio, Yeah. right? And that will work through me over time. And you've had so much money go in actually what ends up being so few stocks. Like mm -hmm. today you buy the S&P 500 on the premise that it's a diversified portfolio, but you're what? You're 35% in tech and 4% in energy. Yeah. Um, and, and that 35% in tech is all correlated one for one with each other. Um, and even so, less you know, gold miners. <laughs> oh, and, and like 0 0.5 gold miners, yeah. whatever it is. I'm picking, I'm picking that number out of thin air, but it's, it can't be very much. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, th I think what's going to happen in the next bear market is that a lot of people who think they have a diversified portfolio are going to find out that they don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I also tend to believe that the bear of the the brunt of the bear market will be a lot of the bear market will be borne by the U.S. dollar, and so most American investors actually won't even notice it mm -hmm. uh, because when your currency falls, you know, a dollar is a dollar, right? You, like yeah. most 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 people don't think in terms of of currencies, uh, but in terms of global real purchasing power the adjustment will probably be taken more by the dollar. And so it might not be that painful actually yeah. for, for the men in the street. Well, listen, uh, Lewis, I want to uh, thank you. I, you know, we could talk, you have so much information. We could talk to you for hours and, uh, and you've got such a great worldwide look. And, and as you've seen everybody watching this all along here, um, you can get in touch with Lewis at his firm. They do a lot of work all over the world, but uh, Lewis, I want to thank you. And, and look, uh, Maybe next year we can have you back. I'd love for you to come back and visit with us. I'd, I'd love to. Thanks for having me, Ted. That was great to catch up. All right, Lewis. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I just want to say, if you like this video and you want to see more of this type of information, because we really try to get the information that you don't see from anybody else, then be sure and click on subscribe and you'll see more of what we do here at Oxbow.